Good morning, John. One of my lifelong obsessions has been the question of whether we are alone in the universe. And there are two big parts to this question. First, there's the lower bar of life living things. Biology happening on other planets or around other stars would be very big news. But then there's the bigger question of, is there anything else like us out there? Not just life, but thinking. Not just surviving, but building culture and technology and loving each other. In the 1960s, when nerds like me were thinking about whether or not we were alone in the universe, Jane Goodall started asking people to consider whether or not we were alone on this planet. I've spent most of my life thinking of Jane Goodall as a conservationist, but I hadn't spent enough time thinking about her as a scientist. A scientist who achieved what very few scientists achieve. She didn't just revolutionize her field, she changed the way the world understands itself. When Jane Goodall arrived at Gombe in 1960, Western scientists knew chimpanzees mostly as corpses in museums or curiosities in zoos. We'd shot them, we'd dissected them, we'd caged them, we'd tested them, but no one had sent, like, detailed reports of what they were like in their world. There was, I think, an assumption that the depth of what it was to be human was never something that would be in any way replicated in animals. That the instinct of animals was just an extension of their biology. So you could almost see everything you needed to know just by looking at pelts and bones, or, if you were lucky, an isolated individual in a zoo. It's not like animals had culture. So why wouldn't that be the case? Jane Goodall did something radical by doing something very simple. She stayed and she watched. And she did it at the beginning without much formal training, which meant she was also open to something scientists had often been trained to be closed to. All right. So the great innovation of modern science has been the deliberate attempt to eliminate any sources of possible bias in the observer, in the scientist, to make it impossible for us to find what we want to find so that you only find what is actually true. You want to make claims that can be tested and proven wrong rather than simply believed, to make all the evidence and methods and data available so that the experts of the world can focus their attention on trying to disprove everything and whatever survives that scrutiny gets accepted as part of the body of scientific knowledge. Though conditionally, it can always be thrown out if we figure out something that we missed. There's kind of just one idea here, that like everything should be made as available as possible to be criticized and scrutinized. And from that beginning, a lot of amazing tools were created that resulted in a huge amount of knowledge. It's the best system we have ever developed for uncovering truth. And so it is very important to me, and I think to, to society, when someone finds a place where that system is failing. And Jane Goodall did that. And I see three big failures that she overcame. The first one we already discussed. This was just rarely done at the time. It was expensive and dangerous, and it was unlikely to lead to economically valuable insights. This is a current problem with science. If there isn't anyone to fund it, it doesn't get done. But she and her colleagues, with the help of the National Geographic Society, made it happen. The second exceptional thing about Jane Goodall as a scientist was that she was open to all she observed. Now, this is the job of the scientist, but it is much harder than it sounds. When you're raised inside of a body of knowledge, it's hard to see things outside of that knowledge. If everyone knows that humans are fundamentally different from animals, then you will explain the things that you see outside of that context. This is not a failing of science, but it's a fairly common failing of the people who do science. But then there's the last thing, probably the most important thing, the most amazing thing, the most controversial thing. She didn't let herself be constrained by the methods of science that had been developed, and that allowed her to see further than others had. Now, this is where the institution of science itself had failed here. Now, people might argue with me about this, and that's fine, because of course what science is is very messy. But for me, like at the root, Science, what science really is, is anyone finding ways to ask the universe questions about itself and get answers. And everybody is doing that. Humans have always done that. But when we talk about science in our society, what we're usually talking about is opening up your question asking to scrutiny and skepticism from every direction that you can find to deliver that skepticism and scrutiny. But there's a layer above this that's also something that we sometimes call science. And it's all the stuff that we do to try and eliminate bias and make things available to be questioned and analyzed and disproved. And you've heard of one of the most important pieces of this. It's called the scientific method. But there's also like the entire field of statistics and the way that it standardizes itself. There's the preference for previously created and thus more easily duplicated methods. There's all the very specific jargon so that everybody knows exactly what they're talking about. There's the format of scientific papers that's fairly standardized. All of these things are tools that we have developed to make it easier to 
to do this new kind of science. And I say new because it's pretty new. I don't know what the right terms are here. We don't need to get deep into the history of all this. This isn't something that like happened on a day. It's evolved over time and we've gotten better and better and better at doing these things and, and building more tools that allow for it to work better. This version of science, in theory, the idea is we don't wall things off and hide things and protect our ideas. Instead, we try to force ourselves to disprove our ideas. And when we fail at that, we ask other people to do it for us. And we do not go on vibes. We go on data. And a bunch of tools and norms get built up to help us do these things well. But when we mistake the tools of science for science, we can miss things. And Jane Goodall's work is probably the best example I can think of, of where this process went wrong, and then inspired by her work, how it self-corrected and has gone off in the right direction. In the case of studying animals in the wild, biologists in the 60s and 70s and 80s, they weren't just contending with the preconceived notions of their time, they were contending with the tools of science that asked them to shelve their subjective judgments. And there were reasons to do that. An important tool is trying to turn off the part of your brain that makes assumptions, that made connections that maybe wouldn't be supported by evidence. We do have a bias to put our experience onto others. So anthropomorphism, where you imagine an animal as having all of the traits of a human, that was understandably a thing to be avoided. But it moved from something that you should just avoid to being seen, I, I think, as like inevitably irrational. If you put in a paper that an animal felt grief or jealousy, that wasn't gonna fly. That wasn't gonna pass peer review. That's sloppy and, you know, hard to do statistics with. So scientists built in rules. Don't name your subjects. Don't describe personalities. Don't speculate on motives. And those rules, I totally understand where they came from. And they made us blind. If you're trained to never describe an animal as jealous or grieving, even when you see behavior that looks exactly like jealousy or grief, you learn to filter that out or to code it as something more mechanical. And I think there's an interaction here with the preconceived notions of the time, with the accepted scientific thought that humans were intrinsically unique and different and animals were much more mechanical than us. There was that idea that was the accepted wisdom, but then these tools of saying you can't anthropomorphize, you can't see personalities, you can't try to imagine human politics happening in this world. That was feeding evidence into this other belief. The tools had become a lens, and that lens was showing us one interpretation of reality, the comfortable interpretation, the one that we already believe. This was a situation where the tools designed to help us uncover truth were hiding the truth. Jane Goodall saw past that, maybe because at the beginning of her career, she was not part of the scientific establishment. In Gombe Stream National Park, a young woman without a PhD sat quietly with a notebook and a pair of binoculars. She lived there. She watched. And the revolutionary thing here is that by bringing her objective observation, she saw a reality that the tools we had built in order to help us become more objective were actually hiding. And since she saw past that, she started to do science differently. She gave the chimpanzees names instead of numbers. She noticed their anger. She noticed their tenderness. She noticed their connections and their curiosities and their politics and their technologies. And she gained their trust. This was where she saw David Greybeard strip the leaves from a twig and use them to fish termites from a mound. And because she broke the rules, she saw what the rules had hidden, that the boundary we had drawn between ourselves and them was thinner and fuzzier than we wanted to believe. Most revolutionarily and problematically for when she would go on to get her PhD, she became their friend. She did things that you're not supposed to do. In fact, things that later she would recognize were not the right way. Like she fed them. She, she became friends by offering them things. She interacted with and thus affected them, which if you're just doing field work, isn't something that you're supposed to do because it's affecting their behavior. She wasn't doing biological field research or even though I think that what she's generally considered to be as an ethologist, so like a studier of animal behavior, what she actually was was like a cross-species anthropologist. Which is why, for my money, if aliens had ever visited Earth, Jane would have been a real good choice for the first person to spend time with them. Those first years at Gambe didn't just produce data, they produced a revolution in our understanding of ourselves. The images sent back captured worldwide attention. Sometimes I lament that we must live in a world without Neanderthals, and that is a bummer, but we are not alone. What scientists had dismissed as instinct began to look suspiciously like culture, and what had been beasts began to look maybe uncomfortably like people. And many other ways of knowing never missed this. 
other cosmologies across the world see animals as kin or as nations of other peoples or as relatives with their own societies. One of the many things that Jane Goodall's work reminds me of is that there are many ways of knowing. And sometimes when different ways of knowing interact with each other, you get truths that you wouldn't otherwise find. And now that our eyes are open, scientists continue this work. What once seemed unthinkable, that other animals had culture and politics, is now supported by data gathered with rigor and patience all over the world. We see elephants burying their dead, dolphins teaching hunting techniques, crows passing knowledge between generations, postmenopausal orcas guiding their pods through lean times. Jane Goodall didn't just show us who chimpanzees are, she expanded the very range of what science could see, and she showed us that we are not alone. John, I'll see you on Tuesday.